this is my first time here today and I uh, appreciate being invited down. Um, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I want to say a special hello to Jared Lafrenet here in first row. He worked for me this summer. And I'm also proud to say that we have two full-time Ball State graduates in a firm of eight people. Uh, Jessica Smith, who is working on the Soldier Field project, and Nadia Simku, who we just hired a couple months ago. Um, the idea of this talk today came from an idea that Jared mentioned to me. So if the talk turns out good, you could uh, thank him. And if it turns out bad, you could blame him. Um, it's a very personal kind of talk. I've never given this before. And I thought it was appropriate here at Ball State with, with both the architecture and landscape schools together, and also the fact that you have a program in the first year where you're exposed to both different uh, professions. Um, this is sort of like a scrapbook. It's, it's going to be personal. Uh, it's not going to be your typical lecture of here's project, first project and second project. Although I'll finish with some projects, uh, three projects. Um, a project in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and uh, Soldier Field, uh, for those who just went to Chicago. I'm sure you, you didn't miss it. And also, we're working with Willem Molzan in the Central Library in, in Indianapolis. Um, what I'm going to start out in a chronological way, it's a 25-year span that you'll see. And uh, I also will like to, I, I put together a list of advice. I thought that um, I always like to give people advice in my office. And I thought uh, my 15 minutes of fame today that I would offer you um, kind of, I have 20 points that uh, off the top of my head that I thought about the last month or so. So this is a, a fresh kind of discussion. And um, I wanted to first start, uh, give you a sense of where I come from in, a, in my work. And uh, before we start with the slides, uh, my work is highly influenced by Dan Kiley. Uh, he believes from his famous quote uh, that man is nature and not man and nature. Uh, I believe that too. However, my particular view um, is that I view landscape as an artifact. Uh, there's several different ways uh, landscape is rendered. And the reason why it's such a wonderful profession is there's all different facets, like there is in architecture, um, of, of various ways of solving problems. Uh, artifact, is, as you know, is a noun. It's a simple object. Uh, landscape, uh, for example, showing human workmanship or modification. And that's the way I like to see my work really as an artifact that uh, it's, it's modified in its normal state that it can be perceived and, and understood. Um, some other things that, that I, I've thought over the years um, is that I, I believe that landscape is primarily a sectional study uh, of proportional relationships. And I've, I've seen in all the studios all the models you make, and, and um, it's, a, it's a valuable tool as well, making models. As landscape architects, it's very important to exaggerate the vertical scale because the scale of the outdoor space is so much different than uh, interior space. Plant material is also um, exaggerated in our work in spacing and quantity. I, I think that uh, that's another point that I, I learned from Dan Kiley is that uh, whenever you're doing a planting plan, it's always very good to in a sense, in your first schematic to overplant the project, knowing full well that it's going to be value engineered. And then by the time that happens, you still have a decent project. Um, the other thing that I like to, uh, to describe my work, and my professor at Harvard was Michael Van Valkenburg, and he likes to use the word immersion, that you're literally swallowed up in the landscape uh, by grading, by plant material, by procession. Uh, another buzzword that, that I like to use a lot is appropriateness. Uh, Dan Kiley would always stress uh, this word all the time. And I think it means primarily, uh, it's, it's quite obvious, to, to, to study your surroundings and client needs and sight and be sensitive with what you're doing. Uh, the other thing that really uh, I think makes this a, a great profession is the fourth dimension or time and process. Uh, the change in evolution of landscape sets us apart really from any other art form. And uh, when I was learning history on landscape, Humphrey Repton's uh, Little Red Books of the fold over 
of the before and after renderings really captivated me uh, as a student. Uh, it was very theatrical, but it was very effective in illustrating uh, not only before and after, but, but how you perceive a landscape to, uh, to evolve. And, and uh, I'm sure when Olmsted was designing a central park, that what you experience now is what he thought of. However, um, in our lifetime, uh, in many of our works, we'll, we'll never be able to see that. But I, I think that as landscape architects, it's a very optimistic field. And if you're a cynic or a negative person, um, you're going to be very frustrated because um, it, it just takes a lot of time. And you're really designing for future, future generations. Um, and, and to conclude, I, I think the strength and soul of the landscape profession is change and process and the evolution of a place. And with that, I'd like to start the slides, please. I have a lot today, and I understand um, most of you have a class at 5 o'clock. So I'm going to, um, a lot of the work I'm showing, once again, is a chronological scrapbook. So it's really meant to, to show a story, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end for those of you who can stay. This is uh, me on the right in the early 80s with Stanley Tigerman, one of my teachers, and I'm sporting a, a Fred Perry tennis shirt there, kind of dating me. And uh, to the left is Philip Johnson's famous cover on time. I wanted to give you uh, a context of when I was in school, uh, late 70s, early 80s, when postmodernism really came to the forefront. And I, I um, attribute postmodernism uh, to making me become a landscape architect. Uh, it was a very frustrating time because the faculty was split down the middle of, of this new kind of genre and uh, more modernist functionalism kind of professors. And it was not fun, it was not a fun period to study architecture. And throughout my five years at UIC, I was kind of striving for a commonality or, or some common denominator that I, I felt comfortable. And ultimately, um, it, it ended up being landscape architecture. These are some examples of the work that I um, took up out of the attic the other day. Um, I had a high rise course, and we did. Uh, public buildings, courthouse buildings. Whoops. Wow, this is sensitive. Another thing that really influenced me was the complete works of Louis Kahn, which I now have a copy of on the left, and his wonderful drawings that captivated me where Lou Kahn's drawings included the site as part of the solution. And one of the things that really uh, I was interested in was the whole kind of composition of site and building and not just the building. Of course, the Kimball Museum, one of the, the best works of modern day architecture. I had the honor of being on the AIA uh, National Awards Jury to give this a 25 year award. The clay models that he and his students did at Penn and the drawing on the left, the kind of the charcoal, uh, where Khan was a, a real student of landscape and a total composition of building and, and landscape. I know that it's fairly common now for people um, to show this as an inspiration, but uh, it was. Um, in 1978, there was a retrospective of Robert Smithson's work in Chicago that I happened to go to. And uh, the spiral jetty and all of his landforms that he did. I mean, that one image there um, uh, with the kind of the, the, the shrimp that were caught up in the, in the tide that created that pink color. Um, and also his non site work that was in galleries behind me uh, really made me start to think about uh, landscape in a different way. The Woodland Cemetery by Asplin and Lurowitz. Uh, the famous picture of the, the cross on the hill and the elms on the mound, uh, a totally uh, artifact kind of landscape that was all made. Um, the plan behind me um, is, is quite elegant in terms of its procession and uh, grading the landforms. Um, 
During one of the courses in architecture school, uh, in the high-rise course, we were given uh, presentations by consultants. And this was one of the classes that really steered me towards landscape. Joe Carr, who had worked for Dan Kiley in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, I'm sorry, late 70s, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting confused here, late 60s. Um, I was there in the early 80s. Um, he did the Oakland Museum drawings and he showed layer after layer of elevation of plant material. And I've had the pleasure to be at this place and it was very captivating that that here was a landscape architect that was describing the work um, uh, just at the same as an architect just you know talking about a building. In our second year in architecture school, we made the pilgrimage to Columbus, Indiana. And um, that was another uh, memorable moment. Um, the architecture, in my opinion, at that time, was all kind of screaming out to, to look at me. And the thing that I liked the most was the landscape. Dan Kiley's Irwin Bank, the Miller Garden, which of course we didn't get to see, um, and also the, uh, the church here, I forgot the name, but Aeroserenin's Church, uh, with the, the best designed parking lot uh, that I've ever seen, um, with the hedges and the trees. And of course the Miller Garden here. Uh, I grew up outside of Chicago and went to school there, uh, as you know, and. Uh, Dan Kiley's McCormick Court on the south side to this day, in my opinion, is really the best thing in Chicago. Um, it's over two and a half feet of soil, and how Kiley got away with uh, doing uh, Crataegus, you know, the Crustalii with thorns uh, is an amazing feat, and uh, they've been limbed up over the years, and uh, there's no way you can plant this tree in the public uh, realm anymore. But I haven't heard any of any lawsuits or anybody getting hurt. But there's no question that this tree in the winter is much more interesting in texture than the uh, Enormous variety. One of the breakthroughs, uh, I entered the Vietnam War Memorial Competition in 1981. And uh, I won a merit award, which was a huge thing. They picked 40 out of 1,400 uh, entries. And of course, this was the start of Mile Lin. And uh, uh, I had to take art in the curriculum. And rather than taking a course on color or painting, I approached the dean and said, I'd like to do this competition. And then the dean said, that's fine, but um, you can't be, you, you can't have a, an advisor that's an ar architect. And I said, great. And he said, I'm going to have you work with a sculptor. And uh, you're going to do it that way. So. It, it made me really focus on a different way of looking at things. And um, uh, this was primarily a grading solution as well as a sculptural solution. And I was also influenced very much by Lou, Lou Kahn's uh, memorial for the uh, six million Jews and also the uh, work of Carl Andre. This, this project, the, the uh, program, uh, was to inscribe 50 some thousand names at eye level. It wasn't Maya Lin's idea, it, it was on the program. And the question was, uh, how do you do that? And I chose to break it apart into kind of, into uh, platonic forms that were placed on the landscape in kind of a chaotic state uh, with the names inscribed normal to the ground, not normal to the edge of the cube. And the, the uh, actual surface was a translucent glass that would be lit from within in Washington, in my opinion, is much more powerful at night than during the day. And the model on the left, and then the image on the back of you was a, a real inspiration of a project that was never executed by Khan. Plan on the right in, in elevation. Uh, most of the schemes that won were horizontal, and uh, this was really the, one of the first major uh, memorial competitions that, is, that have started, um, and uh, you all know the story. The work at Harvard was interesting. I, I really, uh, after the Vietnam Memorial Competition, I said, that's it, I, I want to do landscape. And so I went immediately at, in Harvard, and I, I thought, well, should I work first? And, and uh, the thought was, well, I have some catching up to do because uh, I'm committed, so I, I, I think I should jump into it. And I went to school there in, a, in the recession in the uh, 
uh, mid-80s. And the, the nice thing about that was that the student um, demographics or the student cross-section was quite varied from people in their 30s and 40s to people that had their own office. And so the class was quite strong in a sense of experience. And uh, I was one of the youngest ones there. And it was a very humbling experience. The, these are two planting design courses that I took with Michael. And I, I took the planting really seriously because as an architecture student, um, I really wanted to focus on planting. And that was my goal with two years there. The, the drawing on the right is a Katsura Bosque um, right near uh, Peter Walker's fountain, which was built when I was a student. And behind me is a, a sketch of a birch garden in a kind of a black stucco uh, lower uh, kind of courtyard. Off to the right, I did a garden called sumac succession on a derelict piece of land where I showed the sumac over time and throughout the seasons. So another thing that struck me was seasonality and somehow representing that graphically. Also, after this is a project after my summer. I, I first worked for Dan Kiley between my two years at Harvard. And this was a project in Stamford, Connecticut, kind of uh, using the Lombardi poplar and perspective and landforms and showing the uh, nocturnal conditions and uh, also the grading and plan on the left. Using watercolor. And this is a, a public park with baseball diamonds inserted um, in the space. The last year at Harvard, I was on a team with Michael Van Valkenburg and John Whiteman. And we were fortunate enough to uh, win second place while I was a student. And uh, uh, winning second place is really uh, a sore feeling. Um, I don't know if any of you have won second place before. But sometimes, if that happens, you almost wish you were honorable mention. Um, and when you find out why the winner won, it's even, even worse. But um, we proposed a very formal space um, that made people walk around the square. And of course, the winning scheme has the major diagonal uh, from the T-stop to the John Hancock building. And uh, we, made, we took a risk. And, and uh, we still think you know, it was a, the right thing to do. And this was another great opportunity. And I can't strive enough to all of you um, to enter competitions, as many as you can, um, because it, uh, these two competitions I showed you really uh, set me apart in terms of pursuing things. This is Dan Kiley and myself uh, in, the, in the studio. The three years that I spent in this, uh, with this wonderful man um, really was the best of my life. Um, I can't describe. I could, I could have a separate talk on that experience. Um, but I really attribute all of what I consider uh, to be my career with, with his, his way of thinking about things. And certainly nobody will be able to. Um, really match his effort in the fact that he was self-taught and, and maverick. Um, but uh, I look back at these years as, as a really wonderful three years. And when I was able to work for him, I decided um, that there was plenty of time to do my own thing and to, to open up an office. And so I went to his uh, office just having been married and moving out to Vermont. And I just wanted to be. Uh, uh, and absorb and listen. And uh, my, my, my frame of mind was simply to learn. And uh, after three years, I had to move on. But uh, it was a beautiful environment. It was on a 300-acre farm about 15 miles south of Burlington, Vermont, on Lake Champlain. Long winters. Long winters. I thought Chicago was bad. One of the major projects I worked on for, for all my time there was the then called the North Carolina National Bank. And unfortunately, right now, it's in a terrible state. Um, this is a prime example of designing a very intricate project that the city ends up maintaining. And it was a mistake from the beginning. And I, and I, I sense we were all optimistic about, um, about this project you know, evolving. And 
unfortunately, it's, it's become a place for homeless people in Tampa, and um, uh, Vignoli is doing a new project to the Tampa Art Museum, which is right next to it, and he's kind of colonizing and building over the space. And um, I'm afraid that the fact that it is a public park was the reason that the museum is kind of taking over the space. Um, but it's a roof garden uh, on the Hillsborough River, and the, the use of kind of the Fibonacci proportioning system, Harry Wolf was the architect, and there was a real symbiotic relationship with the building and the landscape uh, being the same pattern on the ground and vertically. Uh, some fountain studies that, that uh, I rendered on the right there, um, definitely Moorish inspired in precast concrete. And uh, three feet of soil on top of a roof deck. Uh, we planted over 300 crepe myrtles and palm trees going down to the river. During my tenure at Dan's, um, uh, Dan is a very um, dominating person, and, and uh, he gets what he wants, and that's, that's fine. And I, I felt that I needed to do my, my own work, so I entered the Kent State Memorial Competition and won third place, and I proposed a ring of ginkgo trees around the center area, not exactly where some of the students were shot, um, but the, the center of campus. Also, I was totally mesmerized by the Vermont Farmhouse, and I entered the Innovations in Plywood competition and uh, won a, a national award. Uh, I just had to get this out of my system, uh, the wraparound porch and um, everything. Going to, uh, to North Carolina, uh, after three years with Dan, I've, I felt that I needed to execute and, and do more work. Uh, Dan's office at the time, we did conceptuals, schematics, and design development, and we worked all over the country, and at the time that I worked for Dan, he was up there in age, and he's still around, just to give you a perspective of how long he's been with us. But, uh, he, he wasn't concerned when I was working for him to really execute projects and CDs, and, and as a young professional, I needed to do that. So I moved to Char Charlotte, North Carolina for a large uh, architecture engineering firm where I was the only landscape architect, and I wanted to um, really work from the beginning of an architectural idea uh, to and integrate the landscape in-house. And uh, it worked primarily with a staff of civil engineers and structural engineers. And uh, it was a great three years, um, leading up to another recession. And then um, uh, I timed the Rome Prize right and was able to, to win uh, after massive layoffs. And this was kind of my swan song in, in Spartanburg. And it, two years ago, it won a national award. Um, it's a, uh, a corporate headquarters for, um, at the time, Spartan Food System was a food franchising firm in a uh, Spartanburg, which is a city of around 40,000 people, uh, about uh, two hours south of Charlotte and south of Biltmore. The area on the left shows the, the city context, and the, the uh, architectural challenge was to insert an 18-story building in, in a community of four-story buildings. The, um, this is the project here. The owner of the corporation was born and raised here, and he wanted to leave a, a legacy. The, challenge for, for me was to mitigate the scale discrepancy of this building to the city by having a, a really powerful garden and public park so that this notion of a high rise in the city would not be an issue. The view on the right is the plan that I'll show you. The, this is a public park that we built and dedicated. This is the 18-story tower with a see-through lobby here and the cores were placed on the ends to allow for this view to come through. This was a future building site that never materialized, and th this was the formal garden um, for people to have lunch and also community activities, and uh, a 100-foot-long wisteria trellis on Main Street to kind of hold the edge. This is a view of the city uh, center. This is the site, and this is the town square here, and it shows that Main Street has the bulk of the mass of the, of the community. This is kind of a romantic view of the Emerald City, if you want to call it that. Um, it's just the whole landscape is surrounded by peach groves. 
And on the left in Gaffney, a very famous water tower, rendered not in a sphere, but in an actual peach shape that be cons construed as somebody mooning as well. Biltmore was a strong influence. You have to understand that I think when you go uh, to different parts of the country, you become infatuated with some of the things. And, and going to the south, the culture, and the whole culture of gardens at Charleston, Savannah, uh, University of Virginia, were just overwhelming for me. And I wanted to kind of extract every possible kind of artifact that I could to replicate. And uh, in this case, Biltmore uh, was a strong influence just in, in, in a sense of the, the French tapé bear, you know, with the, the trellis and the double row of trees uh, are all mechanisms that were implemented in this garden. This is a view of the top, or aerial view. And uh, once this garden matured, it, it was finished in 89, the, the people liked the garden so much that they didn't build the building. And so this is a lesson that whenever you're phasing a project, make sure that the first phase looks looks right and it doesn't need a second phase because in many cases it'll never happen. This is the view of the elevational view I spoke of about the um, gigantic kind of scale to the horizontal dimension here. And this was the future, is that focus? Or? Okay. Um, this, this was planned to be a mid-story here, about nine stories, and this is a wisteria trellis to kind of fill in the gap and, and have mass there at the, the edge. The, the idea of the, the lobby going through was, was my idea working with the architects and we had a great relationship where we worked with the architects in the lobby and they also had you know, ideas for the garden. And the idea was to, to use water as a framing device to really create an inward kind of space and backdrop with a crepe myrtle, single stem. This is a sketch of kind of uh, thinking of a perspective tapé bear with a, a raised garden edge. And the view on the left is it's mature. Th that's a, a picture about 12 years after it was finished. The other thing that really, for this corporate garden, of course dealing with corporate America, um, they had the money to maintain it and, and uh, it was our advice to hire a full-time horticulturalist, which you might think is indulgent and expensive, but in fact they just, they hired a, a you know, a, a, a graduate from Clemson and you don't need to, uh, I mean, you just need to have somebody that knows what they're doing to take care of it. And you need to have a talk to them and have a plan of what you perceived it should look like. The view on the right, the crepe myrtles, um, the flower, and on the left, they're be becoming pleached together. And I chose a single stem because it's normally in the mind's eye a double or multi stem tree. Sorry about that. A little before and after, the picture on the left is right after it was finished, and then on the right, it's kind of um, gone crazy. Um, the wisteria uh, needed to be trimmed here, um, but they let it go, and I think that they, um, uh, when I first went to see it, they were so afraid of really cutting it back, and it wasn't flowering, and uh, they needed to, to add more fertilizer, but the idea here, when it was started, um, was that it was an architectural frame and almost like a gallery or a loggia. There's kind of a delay in this button here. The view from above was very important on high-rise projects. I think it's always imperative to design the ground plane, not only to function for people, but to also to be visually interesting uh, when it's not in use. And of course, this. This uh, trellis is a, a very popular place throughout the year for public as well as the, the people in the building. The Wisteria trellis at Biltmore and here kind of, um, uh, the idea of autumn, the crepe myrtles, it's, it's really quite an uh, amazing place and the Wisteria, it's a primarily a yellow palette. And then this idea of parterre, the view on the left is a garden in North Carolina. Um, and the owner wanted a lot of annuals, and uh, which you know now is kind of uh, frowned upon. But uh, the idea is to give it a frame, an evergreen frame, uh, and uh, it's not so bad. 
the public shares the space, as you can see. Wanted to show a view of construction, the sandy soil, and uh, the, all the crepe myrtles came from Florida in containers. A cross section showing the sunken relationship of, of the Tape Ver to the uh, LA. And the, the image above I saw in a, in a book and I said, I want that. And it took a long time to find a single stem uh, crepe myrtle. It's almost like trying to find a single stem amelanchier, um, which is very difficult. Carlos Scarpa's garden in Venice on the left uh, really enabled me to kind of think of how to articulate a bronze fountain that we designed and had cast locally in Spartanburg out of bronze. And the peach grove um, wanted to somehow have a microcosm of the landscape. And this landscape to your right was never intended to be permanent. This is where the future building was to be located. These are the most satisfying photos to come back and see the space being used and weddings, et cetera. And the public park across the street is kind of the gateway. Um, the ground fell off nine feet and we raised the park to be at the datum or level of the lobby. So on the backside of it, uh, um, terming the word backside, you know, you, you, you think, oh, oh God, what's going to look like? Well, we designed, I think, one of the nicest pieces of the whole project on the back. Um, this is a view of the interior, kind of uh, a fusion of azaleas and dogwoods. You need sunglasses to, to view it. And even on an on a early spring day, people are sitting in the benches. This is the serpentine wall. I, I, I'm, I explained the view on the left just after it was finished and the view on the right, the southern magnolias have matured and gotten really tall. And this idea of a serpentine wall, I was infatuated with the Thomas Jefferson serpentine at, at University of Virginia. And uh, in the south, you don't have to put caps on top of brick walls because the, the extreme temperature isn't as much as it would be here in Chicago. So you could get by with a roll-lock top, which to me makes a much cleaner, elegant kind of um, wall. Okay, I think um, now I'm going to go to Rome really quickly and the American Academy. Um, just to let you know, I applied three times to the Rome Prize and won it a third time. So um, just words of advice that if you don't succeed, keep trying. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, to, uh, to win. And uh, my wife and I were there for a year during the Gulf War in 1990, 91. And, um, uh, that was another, another wonderful year to uh, have room and board paid for, have a studio about 25 feet square with views of Rome and Frescati, and not have any requirements to do anything but just learn. And to me, that's one of the nice things about the Rome Prize is that um, it's just a gift, really, of time and place. And I spent the whole year uh, painting and also doing measure measure drawings of, of things that I liked. And one of the greatest things was to be able to go to, to places six or seven times throughout the year and not worry about just running to a place like any, any person, unfortunately, you know, doesn't have time to really absorb a space. You're just running around photographing and going to the next place. And um, Bill Alante was one of my favorite Italian Renaissance gardens that I, I went and visited seven times during all different types of weather. And um, I can't encourage you enough to consider to applying to this um, wonderful thing. Um, um, usually, uh, they like to, to see people apply after you've worked for five or six years. Or there are people that have won right out of school. Um, this is a view of my studio here and the American Academy here. I went to the academy two years before it was completely renovated. And I'm going back in two weeks for the first time, um, but I'm kind of showing you the frumpy condition it was in for many years, and now it's, it's uh, very different. These are the views outside the studio that I had. A view out of the bedroom on the right. 
and the, the bedroom on the left. One of my many sketchbooks with the fountain on the left that um, was sketched and photographed. I cataloged over 3,000 slides. They're all labeled and um, I was very proud of that because um, another Rome Prize fellow, John Wong of SWA out in California, I'll never forget he was one of my teachers at Harvard and he had a party at his apartment and in one of the rooms he had hefty trash bags filled with slides from his Rome Prize. Um, <laughs> and none of them were labeled and he says, I can't use them. I don't know what's in there, you know. I said, what's the point, John, you know. So I, this was before I was able to win, so I made a point of labeling everything. The uh, water table at Villa Lante. One of the things I was really taken upon was floor patterns. And here I am, a, you know, landscape architect coming to Italy you know, with dreams of the Italian Renaissance garden and the, the whole traditional relationship of the villa and the garden, uh, the marriage of both landscape and, and garden. Uh, but I found myself time and time again looking down at the naves of churches, cathedrals, and um, I just accumulated a sketchbook. And uh, since that time there, there's a book out, and I forgot the author, but there's a book on the Cosmotesque paving um, done by an architect, beautiful renderings. Um, here's some examples. The Duomo on the right, I know. This is Florence. Whoops, sorry about that. I did some fun kind of fantasy uh, watercolors, incorporating these in, in, in a fun way. The one on the right was inspired by the Duomo, and one on the left is the Queen Cux garden. The one on the right is Venice, the black checkerboard of San Marco. I'm going to just talk briefly about Villa Lante because it was one of these uh, experiences that. Um, uh, you, you change your perception when you're able to go there. And historically, this garden's always been viewed as a formal, only a formal garden. And, and the reason for that is primarily the French view of this garden in the 1800s. And it was designed in the 1560s by Vignola. Uh, the aerial view shows its relationship to Bignaya. And this is the main uh, street. And there's a tower here and access. The garden is not only this formal parterre, and the water chain and the central access, but it's this whole Bosco here um, where the, the formality is only one part. And um, I've given talks on this, just this garden alone for an hour, so I'm not going to dwell on its symbolism. Um, but the two casinos you see in the right are the famous casinos. And this is an example where landscape is dominant. The garden is a central theme with the space plowing through and the buildings off to the side. And the, and the fresco on the right was in one of the casinos, and the cardinals built these around Rome, and they competed against each other. And um, Villa d'Este in Tivoli was built first. This was built second. And Villa uh, um, Farnese was built third, and Villa Aldobrandini. They were all cardinals competing for each other. And they, it's kind of in the trophy room of the casino. There's every, every villa painted here. And the Villa Lante, um, is this whole composition. It's not just this kind of axial formal garden here. It's this whole landscape you see. This is part of the, uh, where they hunted deer. It's, you know, it's, now you know where the British and the French got all their ideas. And the, this is another, another view of the garden. The parterre, the famous parterre that you see, kind of the transformation uh, the metamorphosis of nature into perfected by, by man and art. And this is the view of the French, um, Percier and Fontaine in 1820, of the Villa Lante in their catalog portfolio. Uh, this is all they show. They just show the central kind of formal garden. And this is all they cared to really show. Of course, the water chain garden, uh, one of my favorites. 
The garden never intended to have a hedge on both sides. It was meant to be related to the lateral kind of terracing of the landscape. And the gambera, a pun on the gambero in, in Italian, the crayfish. The cardinals had a lot of a sense of humor. Th this is a, a, a just a, a, an idea of going in different seasons. They leave the water running in the winter. And of course, the pressure of the water of this garden is nowhere near a, the way it was in the Italian Renaissance, because uh, the popes were um, essentially warlords that you know um, that had control over everything, and the pressure uh, of these gardens was uh, taken uh, taken away from the um, you know from Italy uh, many hundreds of years ago. So, um, like Villa d'Este, you know the the water. What they did was they built aqueducts up to a head pressure, a really high point. And the whole thing was by head pressure and gravity. And, and this was an idea of transforming an, 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 a garden of antiquity in the Renaissance with high technology of the time. And this is, a, I wanted to show you a plan that nobody really ever sees, is that um, this whole area is the garden. And this, is, this little itsy bitsy thing here is the formal thing you always see. And this picture here is the nice relationship of kind of art and nature of the view from the Belvedere over to, to the uh, forest. OK, in coming home from Italy, um, my first project that I started in Chicago, how are we doing on time? What time is it? OK. Um, I, w I started on this project in Charlotte, and it, it, they were trying to find an expansion team. And while I was in Rome, they, they finally got it. And when I came back, HOK Sport uh, graciously wanted me to keep working on it. So I was able to start my practice with this project. And uh, I started in the building that I'm in now. And it was all done by hand at the time and, and, and uh, on pin bar registered sheets. And uh, I'll never tell the owner this, but I did all the drawings in the whole project. And uh, it was one project for three years and enabled me to start my practice in working in Chicago. And the view on the left is the view of Charlotte and the view of the, of the stadium. And the great dilemma or the problem of this project was there wasn't enough site for parking. And, and what we did was we said, well, that's good. That let's, let's create a, a park around it. And if we don't have a problem of parking, let's make it a nice kind of green uh, promenade. And tailgating and parking is all done off site. And they closed down the city and have shuttle bus services throughout the regional area uh, because you're, it's absolutely insane to drive. And this also proves a point that you know everybody always says you have to have parking for it to work. And in this case, the owner chose the downtown location rather than a cloverleaf near Raleigh or creating infrastructure. And I, I think it was a, a really wise choice because they built the uh, Charlotte Coliseum for the Hornets out near the airport. And of course, they built it too early. And, and now they've left for New Orleans. And now they're trying to bring another team back to Charlotte and build the arena a couple blocks away from this. The view on the right is Kansas City, Arrowhead, and then Lambeau. I'm a Bears fan, so I'm showing Lambeau in, in kind of a, without tailgating here. But um, we know the culture of the Packers and the tailgating and the asphalt. Uh, but this is what we didn't want to, to establish uh, since tailgating was to be off-site, we had an opportunity to make something year-round nice. A cross-section showing the scale of the building and the use of live oaks in the promenade was a, a, an evergreen idea. The whole plant palette uh, was purely dictated on, on fall and winter. And this was a private football stadium. Um, so it, it was really focused on, on the football season. But the, the promenade faces the city here. Um, and a double, 120 live oak trees planted around with various kind of Carolina uh, indigenous plant material. The figure ground drawing illustrates on the right the lawn area around the stadium and on the left the tree mass. The before and after the live oaks, this is about 25 years from now on the right. And on the left is what it looked like when we finished. The use of willow oaks. The view above me is a, is a landscape presentation given to the owners early in the project. 
think watercolors are, is a wonderful medium um, to express landscape. This was done by an artist in Kansas City. Loblolly Pines, the state pine tree, shown on the left and on the right, uh, about six or seven years of time. Everybody said, you know, it'll get destroyed, the grass won't grow, the trees won't grow. Um, and I, I think we've set a model here for, for a lot of new stadiums around the country that um, you can coexist with fans. Question is, can you coexist with bear fans? We'll get with that later here. Um, I don't know if any of you have been to Charlotte, but there's these gigantic panthers that was commissioned um, and planned for each one of the entries. And uh, there's an interesting story where a young boy climbed up and got his head caught in one of them, and ha they had to come out and, and remove the, the teeth of the panther to get the kid out. Um, I'm sure it wasn't funny at the time. I wanted to show you Central Library. I just have a couple slides in Indianapolis. And um, we're doing the garden around Central Library. And um, this is the new addition by Evans Woolen of Woolen Molzan and the, Paul, the Cray Historic Building. In my opinion, one of the most amazing libraries in the country. Um, this is a view along Meridian Street. Uh, unfortunately, the West Garden is not funded. There's a huge grove of ginkgo trees that we're preserving. On the right, where we are building a garden, a reading garden. Um, with a wrought iron fence and also a rotated oval um, with a lot of interesting spaces for reading. This is a view of it. It's really meant for people. Uh, the Cleveland Library, if any of you have been there, is a wonderful inspiration uh, for having an open space for reading. And the view on the left is the Pennsylvania Avenue elevation. I'm going to end with Soldier Field here. I, I'm going to, I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. Um, but I think everybody knows the site. And um, the thing I wanted to mention is that the site is not terra firma. It used to be the water, and it's on landfill, primarily from the freight and tunnel construction in the 1920s. This, this part of the Burnham Park is not fire debris. The fire debris pretty much stopped at the end of Grant Park. The site is approximately 92 acres from McFedrich all the way to McCormick Place to Lakeshore Drive to the lake. And this is a view before uh, demolition here, showing that the landscape is primarily asphalt. These are the pilings uh, put in the lake um, at the turn of the century. And on the left, a view of the south lakeshore. They put these piles in and just filled up into them uh, to, for land. A view uh, that predates the Park District building that was put in in the 40s. It's, it's, uh, Soldier Field was a classic kind of Roman circus open to the north to the Field Museum. And on the right, it was filled in. The site plan on the right is, is the, the uh, proposed plan. Um, it's currently under construction. And this is the view prior to the project where the east side was all asphalt. Uh, this was uh, part of the former stadium, the Park District building, and also uh, just horrible parking areas. And the, the old Lakeshore Drive, you could see here, it came through. And there was, uh, this was done about seven years ago, the uh, Lakeshore Drive project, where they took out this lane and put it here. We're putting back a boulevard, which was highly contentious uh, with the Friends of the Park. It's a four-lane median boulevard in order to, to get you um, from Lakeshore Drive to the museum campus. McFredrich will no longer be the, the only means of egress, and uh, it'll be for uh, taxis and buses only. You, you still will be able to turn into McFredrich, but it'll only be two lanes of traffic versus 11 that's out there now. The idea is to make this a pedestrian connection to the Field Museum to a new parking garage that's underneath the park here. This shows all of the asphalt. And uh, to give you an idea, and uh, we're creating 17 acres of, of, of open land here that was currently a parking lot. There is still a lot of parking. It, it, there's a balance here between making 
a, a situation better and also accommodating the project. And uh, I'm going to take you through these sketches and these, what I call these flashlight images of the plan. And uh, this is a view now when you're coming into 18th Street. And then when you come in now, there'll be landforms. We have over 100,000 square or cubic feet of landfill that we're uh, essentially reshaping around the whole site, using it for aesthetic and also functional needs um, that you'll see. We're, we're designing an, um, a 15-foot diameter stainless steel sphere. that will be a piece of topiary to represent the museum campus. And in the background is a sledding hill. And this is a view you see. Uh, now it's changed, of course. The idea is to create a campus setting uh, with a boulevard that's very Chicago-like. You see them all over Lincoln Park. And we're using the white ash tree for the whole boulevard, which at this time of year will be really breathtaking. The view from the sledding hill, 50 feet above park area, looking north. This actually is the project a couple days ago. Um, you can barely tell the elevation because there's no shadow, but this is about 30 feet above, in, above grade and the, the uh, road in and the stadium completely transformed. The sledding hill uh, was designed with a north aspect and we do have a a wonderful uh, idea. We had snowmaking equipment in the budget so that on the cold winters without snow that it could be used. And the section on the right shows the relationship. The view in front of the colonnade on the east, you'll be able now to go up to the colonnade. It's 50 feet above lake level and view out the lake. And then you have kind of the Darth Vader um, looming kind of glass behind there. Uh, the nice thing I like, this is one of my favorite parts of the project, where in front of the colonnade will be a formal open space that will it'll finally be anchored, in my opinion, to the park. And the view in the winter, the white ash trees, you know, projected several years in the future. This is the park above the parking garage. We're using landforms to try to eradicate the idea of a parking garage. Normally you see just parking garage, this flat pancake idea, and we wanted to create an illusion that it was terra firma. And we made models. Um, I'll show you in a minute. This is the view when you leave the parking garage. You'll get this oblique kind of diagonal perspective of the Field Museum. And the view off of McFederich right now, just uh, you know, a sea of asphalt. And then the American Linden formal kind of uh, bosque and, and alley of trees. This is the view of the, of the park over the parking structure. Kind of the metaphor here is a, like fabric that's lifted up and kind of folds over the landscape. And showing kind of creases here in the landscape and, and almost kind of uh, echoes of sand dunes. But the spiral is the children's garden. This is a view of the children's garden. Its, its theme is natural history and the, the, the museum campus shown right here, kind of inspired by, by the Milky Way and the Nautilus, a sketch idea of the spiral. Jared worked on this this summer. It went through like three iterations because all the museums don't like each other. And I don't, <laughs> at the time we thought it was a great idea, but the cross-sectional views of all of the elements in the garden with a, like a dish amphitheater. We have a gate for the kids that um, is a sphere with cultural symbols all over it with a tunnel. And I wanted to end here. I have, uh, I have some things I wanted to mention after this, but uh, the road traveled for me was definitely to the right, not the left. And uh, I'm glad I made that choice. Um, some words of advice, uh, you know, take them for what they're worth, but I thought I would tell you some things here. Um, a lot of these might seem obvious to you, but uh, as, you know, as ever, if you get older and get more experience, um, you know, as Dan Carley says, you get more humble with age. Um, there's a lot of simple things out there that I just want to reinforce. One of them is to take risks. And number two, know your history, do research and know how to extract information and go forward with it. Uh, read about other fields. 
and sciences relating to the environment. Uh, build professional relationships. Start here at school and during your internship. But know the history of our profession. If we're not interested, how do you expect anybody else to be? Always be prepared when making first presentations, interviews, or even a date. You never know when you'll get a second chance. Um, sketch, read, travel. Always travel as much as you can and keep a journal. Be optimistic. I, I like to compare a landscape architect to a parent where nurturing is absolutely necessary to survive. Uh, enter as many competitions. I already talked about that. And you have to have passion. Um, I recently saw, a, I was recently in New York, and Michael Burton, who coordinated the recent World Trade Center cleanup, um, mentioned there was three major reasons why thousands of people worked so well together, obviously from, you know, from such a horrible event. Uh, number one was teamwork. Two was passion, which certainly we know why that was. And three, you know, surround yourself with smart people. Strive for your work to have a strong presence to last through generations with good materials, detailing, and most importantly, design that transcends fads or styles. And never be totally satisfied with your work. Have an attitude that you need to keep putting pressure on yourself. Don't be in a position for others to put pressure on you. If this happens to you, you're not working hard enough. A project is really never done in the minds of good designers, always sketching, discussing, self-critiquing, complaining, being afraid. If you read some of Frank Gehry's uh, work and the way he operates, he says he's always scared to death about things. And it, it's okay certainly for you to be. Uh, at a point you have to have courage, conviction, and confidence to, if you studied the project and build the damn thing and get on with it, uh, take lessons learned to the next project. Lay people pretend not to know anything about architecture. Lay people think they know everything about plant material. Do not let this bother you. Just go along and prove them wrong with solid research and do not give in. And also recognize that there are people out there that might know more than you do um, about plant material. Go with your instincts. Make a decision and go forward. At Harvard, they had a pass-fail grading system, which I thought was great. Uh, it enabled you to take risks. Um, sure, they had awards and scholarships, but um, about half of my projects didn't really fare well with juries or things like that, and it was painful at the time, but I'm glad I did that. Have a sense of humor and a good library of music to cheer you up, and learn to lose often, and get over it on Monday, as spoken from a lifelong Cubs fan. Um, People generally do not like change. Learn how to deal with it. And uh, the art of persuasion is very critical aside from your design skills uh, in, in life and any profession. Um, in order to do well in any significant project that involves more than one person, learn how to be creative, problem solve, communicate, and work for the greater good. You cannot do everything yourself. If you have a burning desire to do a project yourself, Start your own office and, and enter competitions. My final comments are fight small battles everywhere and every time throughout your career. And don't concern yourself with winning the war. Just think of it all collectively. If we did this strategy, one client, one community at a time, and as the profession grows, so should the, the work. Nurture and celebrate the victories, but also be prepared to lose more battles. And don't give up. As my good friend Laurie Owen told me, landscape architecture is a glorious profession. Thank you.